the cloud now actually. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks. So, like I mentioned, let's go over some of the logistics before we actually begin the session today, which is uh, introduction to CI at NERSC. Uh, users are muted on joining. Please change your name so that we can identify you. Uh, instead of doing Q&A in Zoom chat, which is going to quickly get out of hand, please use the Google Doc. Uh, Long-term slides and videos will be posted on the training events page, but for now you can view it through this link. And both of these have been put in the chat, in the calendar invite. Uh, users have been added to the N intern project, and there's a reservation which is uh, valid from 9.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. today. So you can run your jobs without using your own allocations and getting quicker turnaround time. And you can use the scheduler parameters, uh, which are also in the slide deck and the examples later on. So with that said, let me start with my presentation. Um, hopefully everyone can see it full screen. If not, uh, just unmute yourself and let me know. Uh, so today's topic is introduction to CI at NERSC. Uh, essentially what we're trying to do is automate code integrations through Cori. Uh, I'm Aditya Kavalur. I'm part of the user engagement group at NERSC and the site CI coordinator uh, with ECP. That's why I'm talking about CI today. So before we actually get into the presentation, I wanted to lay out the goals a little more clearly, you know, what would count as a successful tutorial. I'm hoping all of you walk away with a broad understanding of GitLab and continuous integration, a fairly good grasp of the fundamentals, a successful execution of the hands-on example, of course, familiarization with NERSC's GitLab instance, because there are some quirks uh, with our instance compared to some other instances. And more than that, just a broad knowledge about useful CI resources. Obviously, you can't learn everything in an hour and a half, but hopefully you know where you can find more information should you want to use CI in your code development moving forward. Right. So with that said, what's the overview of today's uh, slide deck and tutorial presentation? Right. So I'm going to first talk about GitLab CI and ECPCI. Uh, ECPCI being the customization to CI that ECP has uh, done. Uh, our GitLab instance, which is a NERSC GitLab instance. Uh, a little bit about the fundamentals of CI as it as they are in GitLab, and then the examples section. Right. So the first section being GitLab CI and ECPCI. So what is GitLab for those of you who might not know? It's essentially Git plus more features is how I like to think about it. It's primarily a Git-based code hosting service, but they want to provide a platform for the entire DevOps cycle. So they've included a lot of useful features that go beyond just Git. So things like project wiki, issue tracking, project team management, access control, and of course, continuous integration, which is the topic of today's discussion. To be fair and a little even keeled, there are other platforms like GitHub and Bitbucket, which offer similar features. We are focusing on GitLab because we have, and a lot of other DOE labs have a tie up with GitLab through the ECP uh, initiative. So most of our work happens on GitLab platforms. Okay, so what is continuous integration? Uh, I like to think of it as automating the busy work. Uh, for those of you who are XKCD fans, you might remember a very popular strip that came along a long time back, which is the number one programmer's excuse for legitimately slacking off was that their source code is compiling. Uh, we have a joke that says, you know, it's a, it's going to get broader with time. So it's not just compiling, my commits are integrating and you can hopefully use that long term to stack off. 
right? So CI is a best practice in DevOps. So what it essentially means is any event trigger, it can be a commit, a pull request, or time periodicity based, can set off a range of jobs that encompass building, testing, packaging, and deploying the source code that the underlying Git is managing, right? GitLab enables CI through its runner utility. Uh, what a runner is, is basically it's an active process that's running on a target machine that is continuously polling the server for jobs. Users write CI configuration files in YAML. And within those, uh, within that configuration file, they describe a set of runners uh, through tags. And the first acceptable runner that polls the server receives the job. The runner then executes the script and sends the results back to the GitLab server. So it's as easy as that. And there are a lot of customizations possible in CI. You can uh, use the rules functionalities to you know, customize CI configurations for each branch or event trigger type or target machines. Right. So hopefully you get a broader understanding of how GitLab does CI and we'll obviously look at more details as we move forward. So since CI has proven to be useful in a lot of software development activities, why don't we just use it as is in the scientific community, right? So CI is offered on a lot of web servers like gitlab.com. So why HPC? So CI that's offered on gitlab.com typically runs in a container on a cloud, right? That may be okay for most of the cases, but scientific code developers may want to test their code on, you know, DOE facility infrastructure, because at the end of the day, that's where most of the users of their codes run their jobs, right? And developers also have compute hours on HPC centers that uh, you know they might want to leverage to run more expansive tests right uh, so depending on what architecture you're running or targeting rather runners can perform certain common and recurring actions for typical workflows before executing the user scripts right and these common scripts can be leveraged through a particular executed time so what I'm essentially trying to say is within a runner, well, within the category of runner, there are different executor types. And what I mean by that is that it will become more evident when I list the types. So there are different executor options such as SSH, shell, Docker, Kubernetes, et cetera. So what happens in an SSH executor type is the user script. The runner essentially spawns a new uh, SSH connection and the user script will be executed within that. Similarly, you have in a shell uh, executor type that runs with on a new shell and the user scripts will run there. Now, none of these perfectly fit HPC workflows and security requirements. Now you may say, hold on, shell executor seems like a good fit, right? Most of us um, still use you know, terminals to run our most of to submit most of our jobs and interact with HPC facility resources, right? So SSA, uh, sorry, shell seems like a good option, but in this executor, GitLab, even though it's fall sponsor shell where user scripts will be executed, it falls short on two counts, right? Uh, out of the box GitLab runner, with the shell executor does not consider a multi-tenant environment. And what I mean by that is that before the job is executed, there is an initial git fetch that is done. And in this git fetch, uh, the runner passes tokens through the command line. Now that may be okay if you're on your laptop, but on a multi-tenant environment, like a login node, Anyone running PS or, well, to be fair, anyone running a perfectly timed PS can see the job token and using that token can read all of your repositories. They cannot write to it. They can only read, it's a read scoped token, but it's still a major security risk. 
And the other shortcoming is that it does not automate interaction with the scheduler, right? So with users within the script will have to provide certain overhead of how to submit jobs to the scheduler. Poll, if you're using Slurm, you can use uh, S-Control or some other thing to poll the Slurm scheduler till the job completion and then pass return codes. That's a lot of overhead, right? And since it's going to be common for all the users, we essentially want to take it out of the user space. So that's when that's where ECP sort of comes in, right? So the ECP CI team uh, developed its custom executor as part of the ECP project. And what the ECP customization essentially allows users to do is submit CI jobs to the scheduler. Users can provide scheduler parameters as a CI variable. And you don't have to worry about all the overhead of, you know, uh, transitioning between different facilities and uh, moving from Slurm to Cobalt and those sort of things, right? The runner submits the user script as a job and pulls the scheduler and uh, automatically updates once the job is complete. It also allows DCP customization also allows uh, users to run securely on multi-tenant systems. So we pass uh, the tokens using the environment variable git ask pass rather than through the command line. And the third and probably the most important one is that it allows the facilities like NERSC to deploy one common runner and that is then usable by all the users. So users don't have to deploy runners uh, on a project basis or on an individual basis for each project. The facility deploys a common runner. Uh, the runner, when it receives a job, it looks at the GitLab username and then downscopes to the same user on the target machine before executing the user provided scripts. Right, so there's a little bit of uh, magic happening in the background using set UID and other functionalities. And this, what essentially it allows you to do is submit to the Slurm scheduler and sort of charge your existing project accounts and those sort of things. So now that we understand a little bit about the runner, let's move on to the NERSC GitLab instance. So NERSC hosts an instance at software.nurse.gov. Uh, it's a development service. It's not a production service. Most of you might not notice the subtle differences between the two uh, in everyday usage, but there are you know, small differences. Like if there's an outage, you probably won't see it listed in the MOTD page. And you might not find a lot of resources on our official documentation at docs.nurse.gov. So there are little differences here and there, but it's nothing major. Uh, so we try to keep the instance, which is software.nurse.gov, sort of like a complete uh, user environment. And uh, we add users to a Google, Google group uh, for urgent and important notifications. But other than that, we try to put in as much information in our wiki page. Uh, server maintenance coincides with monthly query maintenance to minimize downtime. Uh, you can log in with your NERSC credentials. No forms are necessary for access. Uh, and the documentation, uh, or at least the wiki page, is on the top of each page. So there's a banner on top of each page, which also includes instructions for when you first log in. And we'll talk about this before. Uh, we actually begin the hands-on examples today. Now, uh, you want to add the email to your profile because what this does is that as long as you're running pipelines, you won't get any notification. But if your pipeline fails, then you get an email, which is a really useful feature, especially if you're running uh, you know, nightly tests and those sort of things. You don't have to log in to see every time if you're the pipeline passed or not. Uh, Useful CI workflows, including the examples that we covered today, are in a repository called CI-resources. Uh, the server currently has core level of subscription, which is a nice way of saying it's the free version. Uh, features are still available through API. They're just not automated. Uh, you know, For example, you can 
mirror in code and post job status to GitHub via integrations in a premium license version. But if you want to do it in our instance, you have to you know do a little bit of manual scripting and those sort of things. I like to think of it as you know owning a car with manual transmission. If you know what you're doing, you can get a lot more out of it than a than an automatic if you're so inclined, obviously. Uh, even though it's a development instance, we offer you know certain level of support. So backups are created every Sunday and stored in HPSS. But having said that, I would obviously highly recommend that you also maintain a mirror of your repository at other places, right? Okay, so in terms of best practices from a security standpoint and a little common sense as well. Right? So mirroring code into the server is more consequential than doing that on your local file system, even if it's on you know home or other places. And I really want to emphasize this a lot because I think uh, this is one of the things that get missed by new users, right? So you don't want to think of mirroring on a GitLab instance just as Git clone. You want to think of it as Git clone plus cron job into all branches, right? So each branch may have a CI file that I referenced earlier, which is a pipeline CI configuration file that can trigger jobs for each branch of each repository that you're pulling in by default, right? So you have to be at least initially very careful as to how you're cloning and what the pipeline, uh, CI pipeline looks like, because it can very quickly eat away at your allocation and automating these things obviously has a drawback, right? If malicious code is somehow injected, it's gonna get executed faster. And similarly, mistakes have a larger effect. So a lot of build processes routinely involve a make clean step. And so I would, again, really ask you to look at the workflow before mirroring something in, because you know if someone writes RMRF with a mistake somewhere, you could wipe out a lot of things. And the CI jobs that run, the runner shell is essentially the same as a login shell. So your dollar home directory is real, your dollar scratch, CFS, everything is the same and the user permissions are the same, right? So it offers a lot of advantages, but it also has a lot of risks if you don't fully understand the workflow that you're implementing. Uh, users are obviously responsible for codes they mirror in plus jobs they trigger. Uh, I'll talk about this a little bit later. You have to put down personal access tokens to do a lot of these things. And that's how we know who did what, right? So at the end of the day, you're responsible for things you do either manually or through your token. So generally we recommend that you do not automate mirroring of code you do not own. Uh, obviously if you need to pull in something like SPAC, and those sort of things which are fairly trustworthy, we still recommend you only pull in protected branches, right? Because most development teams have a review process for merging into protected branches, which are a little more intense uh, than other some of the other branches. And obviously you have to also consider that there are differences between GitHub and GitLab as to what is considered a protected branch. Uh, just reiterating a few things uh, just to keep the security team happy is that the runner shell is the same as a login shell. All the file systems are real and user permissions are real, right? So just be careful uh, with that. And the broader NERSC user policy agreement still applies, right? So pulling in code into the NERSC GitLab instance is the same as pulling it into on a Cori login node or something like that. So you don't you're not allowed to pull in export control material and those sort of things. And similarly, you know, you don't share tokens or put them in a location where others can access it. This is equivalent of password sharing. A good practice that we generally recommend is that tokens should have as limited a scope as permissible. So if you only need read tokens for a workflow, only put down read tokens, right? And use 
time validity a good time limit would be 30 days so that every 30 days you can go down put down a new token wherever you're doing this and if you suspect a token has been compromised revoke it immediately and you can inform us through our help portal at help.nos.gov tokens may not just be compromised on your end, there might be a bigger security uh, bug that's been identified. And a good example of this is the recent code cub incident where there was some malicious code in the code cub, right? So we have one of our users who used code cub uh, and his token was potentially uh, compromised. So we had to do a little bit of uh, security monitoring for that as well. So. If you think it's compromised, revoke it immediately and let us know. Okay, so with that out of the way, let us talk about the actual runners on the instance, right? So like I said, we've deployed two, uh, we've deployed common runners. Uh, one is the Cori runner and one is the Gurti runner. So like I said, it's going to look at the GitLab. The runner is going to look at the GitLab username and then down scope to your, uh, to the same username on the target machine before the codes are executed, right? So if you don't have access to GERTI, which is a test machine uh, at our facility, please don't attempt to use it. Your jobs will just fail, right? Uh, it's limited to no staff, uh, but we have it there for a little bit of testing purposes. Uh, Pearl model hopefully will be deployed in the near future on this instance as well, and it'll show up in a similar manner. Uh, all the CI jobs are submitted, like I mentioned to the Slurm scheduler, uh, and you can then, uh, it sort of uh, charges accounts uh, based on what scheduler parameters you provided. Okay, so if you want to put your own runners, we do allow that in cases where it does not, your workflow doesn't fit within the scope of the provided runner. But if you choose to provide your own runner, you are responsible for securely deploying it. If you need help, we can help you uh, set up the configuration and stuff. But since essentially the runner will be under your user space, if you choose to change it further down the line, uh, it's more or less on you. Uh, if you choose to do self-hosted runners, don't make it available beyond the beyond your current project and make sure you appropriately name and tag the runner so that uh, there's no confusion further down the line. I would highly though recommend you to use the official runner. I think only one team that I know of had a special workflow that needed it, needed a self-hosted runner. Otherwise, most of the people are fine with the official runner. Uh, one benefit of using the official runner and GitLab in general is that the other DOE facilities have a similar combination of server plus official runner. So any development that you do at any of these locations, generally portable with minimal amount of work, right? So on the final uh, slide for the GitLab instance, just wanted to reiterate that if you have any issues with the instance, you can always file a ticket with the Nest NERSC help portal, which is help.nurse.gov. And uh, more often than not, it'll just be me, but we really appreciate you going through the official channel. Okay, uh, coming to the fundamentals of GitLab CI, right? Uh, I spoke about this a little bit earlier in that YAML, the CI configuration files are written in YAML, which is uh, yet another markup language. Uh, the default CI configuration file that the server looks for is the .gitlab-ci.yaml in the top directory of the Git repository. Notice the YML and not YAML. Uh, this can also be customized to point to a different directory and file name, uh, which is really useful uh, if the repository needs to target different machines with different CI configurations, right? For instance, if you have SPAC, which is going to run on a lot of machines, uh, the SPAC repository has a NERSC pipeline somewhere deep buried under its repository tree, sort of SPAC share, SPAC GitLab, NERSC pipeline. 
uh, YAML, right? Uh, so what do typical jobs look like, right? So the workflow is categorized in stages with each stage generally having a distinct functionality. So something like compile, test, package, deploy would be standard uh, stages. Each stage can have multiple jobs within it. And these jobs can run in parallel if there is no dependency specified, for example, tests in a test suite. And you obviously use tags to identify the runner that will pick up the job. So looking at a very basic example here, uh, you have you define your stages as stage one and stage two. And within uh, and then you define your jobs, right? So uh, job one A, one B, and two. And in job one A, uh, you say that it's part of stage one. Similarly, job one B is part of stage one, and job two is part of stage two. And that then shows up in how it runs here. And in each of these, you're specifying a tag, which is Corey, uh, the runner I showed you uh, a while back. And then you have a script section, which defines what's going to run uh, within each of these jobs, which are individual Slurm jobs. So each of these three jobs were submitted as individual Slurm jobs using the scheduler parameter specified here. And the scheduler parameters are the same as you would put down in your uh, Slurm batch submission file, right? You, instead of putting it in a file, you sort of specify it as a variable here and the runner does most of the heavy lifting in the back end. So some of the tips that you can use is that in addition to jobs, you can specify hidden jobs. You can see that hidden jobs are identified through a dot at the start of the job name. So these are not executed by default. They are used to inject certain common features into multiple jobs. So if you want to use the same runner, maybe you can have a dot CI runner tags and then you can inject that into a job that's going to run. Similarly, if you have a lot of common script that you want to inject without overriding that section of the job, you can use uh, something like this and identify it through a label and then in the job, you can sort of inject it this way. So in this case, the script is going to execute PWD, LS, and then echo in that order, right? Whereas uh, in if you would specify a tag here and then the extends, this extends would overwrite the tag provided here. Uh, the workflow section of the CI file can be used to control when and if the job is executed by checking the condi conditionalities. And we're going to use this in one of our examples as well. And users can obviously introduce environment variables in the shell through the variable section. So in the previous slide, I talked about using variables to specify sh uh, the schedule parameters, but you can also specify other variables that you need to be present during the job. And we'll see that in one of the examples as well. Uh, a few more useful tips, sections such as variables specified globally that is outside a job are applied to all jobs. They can, however, be overridden locally in each job. A lot of the times when you push a commit, you may not want to trigger a CI pipeline. So let's say you're just updating a typo in your readme section, right? So you may not want to trigger a CI job. You can simply add a bracket CI underscore skip bracket close, the square brackets, and this stops the CI pipeline from being triggered, even if the CI configuration requires it to be triggered on each commit. Uh, if you want to edit multiple files in the same commit, you can use web IDE instead of edit uh, that way you can make changes to multiple files in a single commit, right? So these are very basic uh, sort of starting points and tips that are most useful to uh, most users. So coming to the examples section, uh, let's start with logging in to the NERSC instance, right? So I'm gonna sort of do this 
alongside you all, right? So can everyone still see my screen at a fairly decent size, both the, the presentation and my web browser? Okay, thumbs up, thank you. Looks good to me. Um, on the uh, web page side, can you actually increase the font a little bit? That will be better. Thank sure. You. Let me try the easiest option. Oh, not that good. Is it better now? Yes, thank you. Uh, so you want to log into software.nurse.gov. Uh, I'm logged in, but you can do so. If I do it, it's going to immediately <laughs> log me in, unfortunately. But you can log into software.nurse.gov. Uh, you'll probably see a blank page if it's your first time logging in, right? And if it's your first time logging in, please go to the wiki documentation in the banner. Uh, so this banner is present on all pages, right? And this is sort of your, a helpful starting guide. And we have a, a certain section here at the top again, which is for first time users, you want to add your email address here. So in my case, since it's already added, it's gonna show my email address, but you want to add this here because if a pipeline does fail, you get uh, notification for it uh, in your email, which is a useful feature I've found for most users. Once you add in the email, you want to select the newly added email from the drop down menu to be your default primary email. So, having said that, uh, this wiki page is a really good starting point. Uh, you can see we do a lot of things here. Uh, we tell users how to run a CI pipeline at NERSC, uh, interact with it, and there are obviously quite a few subsections here. Uh, you can increase time out of your CI jobs and quite a few other things. You can interact with a repository through an API, and we tell you how to uh, create tokens here. Uh, and then use the created tokens to sort of interact with a specific repository on this instance using you know a, a shell terminal well any terminal really and how you can store those tokens if you're on a login node you can uh, store it in your home directory and sort of uh, use the git ask pass environment variable route that we recommend rather than passing uh, it through the command line. A few other things that are useful here in this section running a CI pipeline is that we also tell you how to target the different queues and queue policies that are present, right? So there are a few subtle differences between how to target different queues based on how they are set up on Cori. So, oh, I see that the QA doc link is broken. Oh, it seems to work for me. Uh, I'll I'll address that when. Can you check the permission? Is it allowed to anybody has link to have access to? Uh, I think so, but. It's if it's setting to only allow LBL people, then there's a problem. Let me just share it quickly again. No, anyone on the internet can use it. Yeah, okay. so it should be okay. So let me just put that again. Uh, and sorry, this is without the tiny URL, so it might look different, but uh, it's probably- the after thing. you presented all these immersed issues, uh, immersed setting up, so you can answer some questions. So people sure. can ask for the questions for now. But uh, edit the GDoc if you have more questions. Sure. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, so like I was talking about the queue policies, there are certain differences. So most of the production uh, queues like Cori KNL, Cori Haswell are sort of straightforward. You sub 
you provide the constraints, the QoS, uh, number of nodes and time. But there are certain queues like the Cori transfer queue, Cori GPU, and Cori compile, which are not, which require an additional parameter of minus M S core. And what this essentially does in the background is that it's using a different Slurm scheduler, which is outside of the production uh, Slurm. Essentially, it's a different Slurm. Uh, you can do the same thing if you do module load ESS Slurm, then you don't have to specify minus M S query, but we recommend doing it this way just because it's easier. And it's these two queues, Cori compile and Cori expert, are essentially useful uh, for doing certain simple tasks that I'll talk about in the examples uh, section. And they are essentially free of charge. So having said that, let's come back to our slide deck and start with the first example, which is the hello environment. So there's a repository listed here, which is essentially uh, in the CI resources section that I mentioned. Uh, and let me just quickly copy this. Right. Uh, just in case uh, some of you are not on the presentation online. Uh, so what we want to do here is we want to execute a simple CI job that scopes the environment, right? And let's see. Okay, so it's this one. So you see CI resources and there's a sub project in that uh, group. Uh, we want to fork the repository into your user space because obviously you don't have write permissions here. Uh, you want to modify the empty GitLab CI file that we've provided and produce the output as discussed in the readme section and run the CI job, right? So what is the output that we're trying to achieve? Uh, we want to use the before script section to identify uh, use the before script section to first identify that that section is currently running in the job trace log and then use an echo command uh, use do that using the echo command and then view the file directory and uh, using pwd and ls minus la uh, then you want to use the script section to again identify the section in the job trace log using an echo command and then execute the provided bash file. So this bash file. And then finally, you want to use the after script section to identify the section again, and then evaluate who you are and the host name. And why uh, it's structured this way will become evident once you run it, right? Uh, and just so you know that there are two branches here, uh, well, I guess it's not visible in here. So there are two branches here. One is the main branch and one is the nurse answer branch. If you're a little impatient, you can directly go to the nurse answer branch and see the solution. Right. So let's start off with let's start off with forking the project, right? So on the top right hand side, you can see there's a fork button. And if you click on fork, it'll tell you which namespace you want to port the project to. Now, uh, if you have a group already set up, you can probably put it in there, but since it's an example tutorial section, you just want to put it under your uh, user space or namespace. Right, so I'm just gonna select mine and it'll say forking in progress and it'll create a repository which has everything in the upstream project, but it'll just be under my username. Oop. That's weird. Okay, uh, don't know what that was about, but okay. So essentially you can see everything is the same here and it says that it's forked from CI resources, hello environment, 
which is the upstream. And if you try to fork it again, it will just tell you that a fork exists, right? So you can just go to that project instead. Okay, so now coming to the hands-on section. Uh, why don't I do one thing? I'll give you all a couple of minutes to answer, to attempt to answer uh, this hands-on example, and then I'll share the answers with you, right? And another thing that I would like to point out is that for scheduler parameters, you're provided with the reservation and you can use this string to use that directly. So minus C Haswell minus minus reservation equal to CI tutorial one minus minus QoS is equal to shared. Please don't skip the QoS shared because we don't have as many nodes as we have participants. So if you don't specify this, your job is gonna end up taking one entire node, which is not really necessary to run a bunch of echoes and you know uh, PWD commands. So while you're doing that uh, or attempting to answer that, I'll quickly take a look at the Q&A doc section. Does that sound fair? Sounds good. Let me start a timer for Let's see, five minutes should be, well, five minutes is too much, three minutes, and we'll begin in three minutes time again.
Okay, so it's been three minutes. I'll come back to the other questions uh, while we're waiting for while I'm waiting for the for you to execute this second example. Right. So hopefully most of you have been able to run this. Let me just I'll run the pipeline and then I'll come back to discuss how it works because it's gonna take a few minutes for it to run. Okay. So looking at the NORSC answer, the GitLab file, right? So since you are executing, uh, since there are no dependencies necessary and those sort of things, you can use just one stage uh, for this example. And I call that stage examine. Uh, the job is Cory Haswell, just because it's running on Haswell, then you define what stage that job belongs to. Obviously, uh, there's only one stage here. Uh, for tags, uh, since we've not put up any runner here, we just use the query runner. Uh, variables is how you specify the scheduler parameters. In general, you can use something like this. So minus C as well, minus minus two as debug, one node, uh, time five minutes, but since you know, uh, queuing and debug is not useful for these, for the purpose of doing a live demo. We have a reservation that you can use, like I mentioned earlier. Okay, so coming to the actual example, uh, we want to run three things, right? So a before script where we identify it, where we identify the section. So you do a echo before script, you then look at the file directory that the before script runs in. So you run pwd and ls minus la. In the script section, again, you're identifying that it's the script section. And then you're essentially running the bash file that we provided, which is part of this repository. And then again, in the after script, you're identifying the after script. And then you're seeing who you are and where it's actually running, right? So since the job is complete, you see a pipeline passed here. And I'll click on that and it will take me to the pipeline section. Uh, so you see the stage examine job query as well. You can run it again if you want to, but essentially this is what your job trace log is going to look like. Oh, well, uh, before I, get with that, let me actually quickly show you what's in the environment bash file that's being executed. Uh, so the environment bash file uh, essentially does a set command, echoes who I am, host name, username, module avail, well, echo module avail, and then add the actual module avail, right? So it's a little redundant, but we just want to see what it does. So looking at the trace log, you can see it tells you what runner it's using, uh, the runner name, the short token, and you can actually see the tag here as well, right? And if you uh, save, if you choose to save something, you can use artifacts, uh, and they'll be provided here. Uh, artifacts on this instance are stored by default for seven days, I think. Uh, but you can store it up to 30 days. And uh, a few of those examples are in the CI resources section. So coming back to the trace log, you can see it's it saw my username in GitLab, which is at WAV, and it downscoped to the same on Cori, right? Uh, and then it's fetched the Git repository, which is provided as part of my username. Oh, yeah, it's the username here and the environment and the repository name here. Uh, it fetched with a Git depth of 50. That's uh, 
you can change that if really necessary. And then it's submitted it as a batch job, right? So then now coming to the actual user scripts. So you see an echo before script saying before script has started. In, you run PWD to see where it's actually running. So it runs in global C scratch. All this is going to be common for all your users. This is just how the runner was set up. Uh, but this path length is fairly long and I know people have run into issues uh, with this, but hopefully when the new runner is deployed sometime in the fall, this will get a little short, but I'm uh, digressing. Uh, so let's look at what is present in that directory and you see that there's a dot .git and then there's everything else that was present in your uh, repository, right? So now you come to the script section, you do an echo script, you run bash environment.bash, and that's just producing output. You see, who am I? It shows my username. It shows the host name, which is running on a compute node, uh, which is part of the reservation. And then it shows a module, it shows a uname, and then a module away, which is you know, a lot of output. Coming to the after script, so the after script starts here, who am I? I'm still my username, but the host name here is 420. And that's really important. So the before script and script sections run through the Slurm scheduler, but the after script runs outside of the Slurm job. It runs on the node where the runner is actually active, right? So you don't want to do any computationally heavy things on the after script. You're not going, you have C groups uh, limitations there, so it's not ideal to do those sort of things in the after script. The after script is essentially for moving things around and those sort of things, right? And the before script is generally to switch module files if you want to uh, go from the default section to something else. And then the script section is where essentially you want to run most of your uh, user provided scripts. So I'm hoping all of you were able to execute that. Uh, if you do face any issues, just put them down in the Google Docs and we'll work through it at a later date. Right? That doc will be alive, will be kept active for a few days after the session. So moving on to our next example. Oops, this is the third one. Uh, moving on to our second example, which is a simple, which I've described as a simple workflow. It's a typical uh, workflow that you see. So the objective is to execute a typical CI job that builds and runs a couple of executables, right? And you can see the repository is here. Just quickly open it. So yeah, this is a repository that I'm talking about. This is essentially CI resources and simple underscore workflow underneath that uh, group. So you want to do the same thing here. You want to fork the repository into your user space using the fork button. You want to modify the empty GitLab CI file that we provided uh, to create the output as discussed in the readme section. And then you want to run the CI job. And as before, uh, the GitLab CI file in main is empty, but there's a answer which is a little more complicated in the branch nurse answer. Right? You can use the reservation again here and since this, oops, sorry, yeah, since this is uh, essentially compiling and running a hello MPI, you can use uh, two tasks uh, for this batch submission file. Right? So, like before, I'll walk you through what the expected output is, and I'll give you a few minutes after that to sort of write your GitLab CI file, and then we'll discuss the answer in NOS answer. Okay, so what's expected as the output here? Uh, 
you want to fork this project, create a workspace, uh, and you want to create a typical CI workflow that consists of multiple stages and achieves the below objectives. So you want to check the iris quota of your project or a project user under a project namespace to see if it has extended the user provided limit. Uh, what we are using is this repository, uh, which is again in the CI resources folder, which is sort of iris CLI quota check, right? And just to give you a brief example of what you can do is, well, let me just quickly see if I've included an example here as well. Okay. Uh, so what you can do is you can call iris as a command on Cori login nodes, and you can specify a user to show uh, the projects that they have, uh, how much has been allocated and how much has been used on a user basis, which is the first one, and on a project level basis, which is the second one. So in this case, user train 532 has, how much is this? So 200,000 nurse hours allocated from the project entry. And the project entry itself has 2 million NOS cards. So this user has 10% of the total allocation. Uh, 24,211 have been used on a project basis, whereas this user has used zero, right? So you can do a little more advanced things with this. Uh, that's that's actually the iris command, right? We What this does here in quota check is sort of provides a wrapper for it. So you can do, uh, you can provide three flags, uh, which identify the project, the limit, and the user. So using this example here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to check if the user has exceeded an allocation of uh, entry. And how I do that is you can provide bin bash quota underscore check dot sh, uh, specify the project, which is entry, uh, provide the limit, which is percentage basis, so minus L1. So that's, you want to check if the user has exceeded 1% of their allocation in this project. So minus P entry, minus L1, and then minus U train 532, which is the user uh, that we're examining, right? So this user hasn't exceeded 1%. So it's going to put out an output saying project has not exceeded your provided limit. And it's going to have a return code of zero, which is going to determine whether GitLab determines if the job has passed or failed, right? So like I mentioned earlier, uh, if, you, if you don't, if you're not careful of how you set up your CI pipeline, you can quickly use up a lot of your allocation. So this is a good first stage to have as part of your CI production pipeline, right? So we're going to use this, like I specified here, bin batch quota check, project specify the project, uh, L is the limit in percentage, and then U, you can provide your fourth username. So if it has exceeded uh, the L, uh, the limit that you provided, it's going to say project has exceeded, the limit and is going to use do a return code one and then subsequent stages of the pipeline will not be executed right uh, since this stage is not computationally intensive you can use a quick turnaround queue for this stage uh, during your production pipeline so you could use expert compile or shared uh, shared is not free but the other two are you're going to get only one task in the expert queue. So please don't use it for anything other than, you know, checking your application if you don't want to. You can compile in the compile queue as well, but uh, you don't want to do MPI tests in those queues. Uh, coming to the example, you're going to build a simple C program using Intel and GNU compilers in parallel CI jobs, in parallel CI jobs of the same stage. 
uh, you can use the make file provided. It accepts make GNU and make Intel options. Uh, you will need to load the appropriate pre-programming environment module for each build. And then you can these make GNU and make Intel make two different uh, executables. So it's hello exe Intel and hello exe GNU, right? That you need to provide these executables to the subsequent stages uh, using the artifacts options that I uh, referenced earlier. And then in the final stage, you want to create a CI job. Uh, notice that I said create and not execute. So a lot of the times we can, what we can do is we, have, we can have a plethora of tests in the test suite and you can have simple smoke tests run automatically, but a lot of the more intensive sort of scaling tests, we can just create them and leave them to be triggered only with a manual action, right? And you can use the when options for that. Uh, and you also want to create a dependency for each of these executables to the previous make stage. And then you can do, uh, run the executable using something like srun, you know, minus MPI tasks, uh, hello EHC, and then sort it based on uh, the task number. So like I mentioned, the repository has a blank GitLab file, uh, and the answer is in that GitLab file in those answer. Uh, since this is a little more elaborate, uh, I'm going to give you all, uh, let's say, seven minutes uh, to try it out or to go through North answer branch to see what the answer looks like before we start the discussion at then. And in the meanwhile, I'll just look at the Q&A section.
Okay, let's move on. Uh, I'll try to answer some of the questions that are still pending uh, after we've completed the next two exercises. And like I mentioned that the doc will remain active for quite a while. So you can reference back to this later as well. So coming to the simple workflow, let me try to quickly Oh, I forgot to create a fork. So I'm just making a fork like before. And I'll run a pipeline for those answers so that while we're discussing what the answer actually looks like, it will hopefully have completed. Right, so let's look at NERSC answer. So what we wanted to do essentially was first to check in, well, I've called it stage zero, uh, but I guess I'll stick to that numbering. Uh, what we want to do in stage zero is to use the quota check that's provided to check if my username as part of the project and staff has exceeded 10% of my allocation of that project, right? And if it has, I don't want to go, I don't want to run this pipeline anymore, right? So I use job zero, I say that it's part of stage zero. I use the extends option to introduce a hidden job dot CI runner. And as might be obvious, that dot CI runner hidden job just contains the tag core, right? Uh, I specified before script as blank, and that's because I've specified a global before script here that I want to override in this particular job, right? And then I want to run script uh, to check the allocation or to vary the allocation. Uh, like I said earlier, since this is not computationally intensive, in most cases, you're okay with using the X per Q, just ask for one node, I it just ask for one task. I think the maximum you're allowed is two tasks. I'm not 100% sure of that though. But for this reservation, we can use, uh, but for this tutorial, we can use the reservation, which is again, the, the same, right? So that's job zero, stage zero. And then we have the second, well, then we have stage one, which is here. So, oh, no, here. So we have job one Intel, uh, which is going to extend your common build and you provide a variable uh, build type intent. So let's see what the extend command is extending here. So dot common underscore build. What that does is that it specifies that the stage is state one. It extends the CI runner, which is essentially looping in the tag Cori. And you're doing a before script to do a module swap. Uh, in this case, I'm assuming that the default loaded module for my shell is prog and intel. I'm substitute. I'm doing a module swap of prog and intel with prog and build type, and I'm providing the build type. In this case, uh, job one intel is just intel. So this is really meaningless at this point. But since I have a job one GNU where build type is GNU. This is going to, in that case, it will do a module swap prog and intel to prog and you know. Then you do, in the script session, you do a make build type, so make intel or make GNU. And then you use the artifacts section to say, uh, hey, this path that I'm specifying here, this needs to be available to subsequent CI stages. 
right? So each of this job one Intel and job one GNU is going to make uh, hello exe Intel and hello exe GNU. And in both of those jobs, it's going to save this artifact and make it available for the subsequent stages, which is actually testing uh, the executable. So moving on to tech, testing the executable, you have again job to Intel and job to GNU. Uh, this is stage stage two. So you may notice in this case I provided the stage here. In this case, I provided the stage as part of the actual uh, hidden job. So you can do it either way. You extend the you extend the CI runner. You provide a few variables. Uh, in this case, you're specifying the number of MPI tasks and the build type, right? And then you say this job to Intel needs job one Intel, right? So this will only be possible to run if job one Intel had a return code of zero. And similarly, uh, job two GNU needs job one GNU. So in this case, what happens is, let's say job one GNU fails, but job one Intel passes, it will still be possible to execute job two Intel, but it won't be possible to execute job two GNU. So it just reduces a bit of, uh, confusion in, the, in case you want to run the executables at a later stage. The when manual here just uh, specifies that when it executes. So this when manual means that it will only execute on a manual trigger, right? And the script here is just pulling in a label one and then it's doing the SRF command. So let's see what label one is. Label one here is just telling you to list the module list and we can use that to see what all other modules that are loaded, right? And since this doesn't have a before script specified, these stages are going to use the global before script to do a module swap uh, since they also have a build type specified, right? So this module list should show a uh, module the module prog and Intel in job to Intel and prog and GNU in job to GNU. And you have again a global variable uh, scheduler parameter specified here that's going to be used for all the jobs other than job zero, which overwrote that variable, right? So let's go to the CI pipeline. So right off the bat, you can see that the when manual. It sort of creates the CI jobs, but it requires a manual trigger to run, right? So you can click on this and it will give you more information. This job requires a manual action and so on and so forth. Uh, you can trigger it from here or you can directly trigger it from here. So while this is running, we'll see job zero. Uh, again, uh, everything else is the same. Uh, I think I had a remove option there anyways so bin bash quota check checks this it says project has not exceeded your provided limit it's going to return a zero code which means job has succeeded and so we can move on to the next stages the next stage let's use job GNU as an example uh, again all jobs initially start on core 20 the, the runner is actually active and then you actually submit a job, uh, you do a module swap, uh, prog and Intel, do with prog and build type, which is going to be GNU here, and then make build type because the make file uh, uses make Intel or make GNU, right? So then it's going to run this make file, which is a simple cc hello mpi.c minus o, specifying the object name. And this CC is obviously going to be the gray wrapper for the compilers. And then you can see it's uploading the artifact, right? Uh, and this is stored here. You can also browse the artifact from the GUI. It will be saved here 
by default for uh, seven days, I think, although you can increase it uh, by specifying a higher date up to 30 days, uh, if I remember correctly. But uh, yeah, please don't unnecessarily store a lot of data here. Uh, it, the same is the case for job one Intel. You know, uh, everything else looks the same here, except you're creating hello exe Intel and this browse is gonna show the executable that's part of that. Let's see. Coming to the execution stage, uh, here you essentially have two things that are running. You ran the module swap again using the before script. Uh, you did a module list to see uh, what all the modules are loaded. Since this job to GNU, we should see prog and GNU here, uh, whereas prog and Intel is the default for my shell. And then I ran s run MPI tasks, hello, exe, GNU. Uh, since I specified four tasks, obviously it's run four MPI tasks. And job succeeded for this. And the same is the case for the other one. Right, so I'll, since we're running short of time, I'm gonna assume most of you were able to run it. And I'm going to quickly talk about the next couple of examples. So there are, and this is sort of bouncing off the question that was asked in as well. So how do you mirror in code uh, from an external repository, let's say GitHub? And then how do you post job results? So this is an example, again, it's in the CI resources section. Uh, we just want to understand how to securely mirror in code from external sources using token. You will need to create a personal access token, one for the NERSC instance. And if your source repository, let's say on GitHub is private, you need a token for your GitHub username as well, just so that you can git clone or git image. Right. Uh, you need to create a mirroring repository that performs the mirroring. So, like I said, this is this instance is a free version. So, you can do a lot of things. You just have to do them uh, through scripting. Uh, you need to create two repositories: one that performs the mirroring, and one that uh, has an empty target where the source project will be mirrored in, right? And in the mirroring repository, you need to create a shell file that performs the fetch and push operations, uh, and then create a CI pipeline that will execute the above shell file, right? So this is a little intense, so let me show you a schematic for it. So in CI resources, there's a project called mirroring. Now this has three repositories. What we're trying to do here is use the source repository, which sits on, let's say, GitHub. And we want to use the mirror repository to push this from, to pull from the source repository and to push to the target repository. So going into the mirroring repository, you can see a sort of schematic here, right? So the source project sits on GitHub, your mirror repository and target repository sit within NERSC. And this is important because they we use certain things that are possible only in our NERSC instance. Uh, so it's really important that these two sit inside the same instance. So what you're going to have is a mirror repository runs a CI job for a mirror.bash. It pulls in stuff from the source project and it pushes it to a target project. There is a little more detail here on uh, you know, a few of the best practices and sort of walkthrough of how to run the example. But essentially you're going to create a personal access token to create and uh, put that in the mirror repository. So like I mentioned, the mirror repository or any repository where you're putting down your tokens need to be private. Right, so let's say you're part of the HDFI group. You have, let's say, github.com slash, uh, I think, I forget, they have a HDFIO uh, project and within that they have sub projects, right? So let's say 
let's use let's use something simpler github.com slash spac slash spac that's your source project and here you want to push to software.nerds.gov slash spac slash spac right so in your target project you obviously need a lot of people to have access to that so you create a different repository which is your private repository and you don't add other people to it and you put down your tokens here so that multiple people's multiple people can be in your project target project to look at the job logs and collaborate but only you are present here where your tokens are visible right and it lists how to put down the variables you need to mask it so that it's those variables aren't visible in your job logs and you can protect it so that the variables are only visible in protected uh, branches i'll sort of quickly look at what the mirror bash does so the mirror bash essentially is doing is running on a core compute resource and it's going to git fetch your original repository using the source repo and the source personal access token and then it's going to add a target and it's going to push to the target repository you can control which all branches or which all tags you want to pull in so if you remember i mentioned that you generally don't want to pull in all of the branches and all of the tags because it can set off a slew of ci jobs right so you can specify which branches you want to cure and essentially once you run it you're going to have but well, hopefully i had done this and you have your source repository which only has a readme and a commit b97 has been pushed to a target repository which has only a readme and the same commit b9 right so for completeness i'm putting the source repository within nurse but the source repository can sit on github or any other place right uh, similarly for the next sort of quick example people may also want to report ci status back to github or ci status to github if your original project sits on the gitlab instance on our gitlab instance so again you need to create personal access tokens uh, one for the nurse instance and one for the external github instance you will definitely need uh, a personal access token for the github instance in this case because you are actually writing to the github repository right in this case instead of the mirror repository you have a report status repository where you store personal access tokens and in this case you have a python file rather than a shell file uh, that does the actual push and we do python instead of shell because we want to protect the token and there are a little more excuse me details about that in that in uh, this readme section so again this example is in the ci resources report status repository you have your target project in this case it's obviously flipped because uh, the pipeline ran in your source project by definition uh, which is gitlab within nors and you have a report status repository which runs a ci job for status github dot py and it uses api calls here to get uh, information about ci pipelines and then to post it to your target project right there's a, a little bit of description here as well and let me quickly walk you through what this does i think i haven't specified that here but essentially what you want is you want to call you want to specify the status source branch so again uh, like i mentioned in the previous case you might not want to pull in uh, all the branches to software.nurse.gov similarly you might not want to push ci job statuses of all your 
branches on software.nas.gov. So you can specify status source branch to uh, provide names of the branches that you want to push CI job status on to GitHub. And you can provide status target context to specify which, uh, what they should show up as, right? So let me quickly see if, oh, I, well, I deleted that. So I can't show you that, but essentially on GitHub, dot com it's going to show up as it's going to show up as something like this right and when i click on this i specify the context as nurse so it's going to show up as nurse and if you click on the details it's going to take you to the ci pipeline that actually ran the job and push the status, right? So in this case, it failed, so it's showing us a cross, but if it succeeds, it's gonna show up as a tick mark. Okay, so I know that was a little bit rushed, but I think the purpose of this talk was to do sort of like an introduction. And this, I believe, are intermediate examples, right? So it's not really, within the scope, but I know a lot of people have um, repositories on GitHub. So if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask them. I'll stop the recording uh, now. And you can also, you know, put down questions in the Google Doc and check at a later time. I'll mostly have answered all of them. Uh, thank you again for your time. And like I mentioned, I'm going to stop the recording and please feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions. Thanks. If not, I'll in the meantime, just walk through some of the questions orally and uh, put them in the chat later as well. Uh, put them in the Google Doc as well. Are collaboration accounts supported for running CI jobs? Not currently. This is a security concern. Uh, I won't bore you with the details, but we do have a technical solution in mind that will work uh, that uses something called like a token broker uh, that we hope to deploy pretty soon once it has security clearance at the facilities. And that's not just at nurse, that's at other facilities as well. Is there a YAML linter to check YAML syntax? Yes, there is. Uh, it's the same as gitlab.com. Uh, so it will be present on the top right. Uh, in the first example, was the before script and after script specific keys for the YAML or user defined? Uh, no, they're user defined. And I'm not 100% sure of what the question means. So if you're still online, you could probably unmute and clarify as to what you actually mean. I'm not sure I completely understand. Uh, the next question is I fork and it wants me to edit a dot yaml file and i'm on and i'm doing that where oh so you click on the you can click on the GitLab camel and then you can click edit here or if you want to do multiple you can do there by the e and then do multiple things here uh, would it be possible to create a dedicated CI account with a different username or some degree of sandboxing relative to accounts? Technically, yes. Uh, but like I said, in the case of nurse, this is possible through a collaboration account. And collaboration accounts don't have 
passwords so they cannot log into the GitLab instance. So there is a little bit of 